Good evening, and welcome to Bible Study Live. My name is Kevin Patterson, and I preach for the Sebring Parkway Church of Christ in sunny Central Florida. And I want to welcome you to this week's midweek online live-streamed Bible study. But I'm going to make a correction right now. First of all, it's not evening where I am. It is morning because I am pre-recording this lesson because I'll be out of town tonight. Also, that means that this is not being live streamed. This is something that we are recording earlier, but we're going to broadcast it at the same time. So we hope you are able to find us just fine and hope you're able to enjoy this study. This study, this weekly study that we have, is something that we do each Wednesday night because we come together and we open up God's Word for a very particular purpose, and that is to try to understand God's will for our lives. We do that so that ultimately we can live our lives in a way that is holy and acceptable to Him. That produces a great consequence, a great reward, because on that last day, if we have lived our lives in faithful service to Him, we get to hear the Creator of all things, uh, the Almighty God Himself, say to us, Well done good and faithful servants enter into your reward. And so that's what we ultimately hope to attain, uh, not just uh, in this life a relationship with God, but we want that eternal relationship with him in that home called heaven. And we want to do this through the operation of his grace and his mercy. And we know that God is faithful and he will do his part, but we want to be faithful to him and do our part so that so we study we learn, we understand so that we can believe and we believe so that we can obey. And that's how God defines faithfulness amongst his creation. So that's who we are. That's who we are striving to be. And I'm so very glad that you've joined us this week. If you are joining us, you're probably watching this on either YouTube or Facebook. And I want to make sure you understand because by the time you watch this particular episode tonight, since it is being pre-recorded, it will already be available to you in its fullness. So when you are done with tonight's lesson, if you want to go back and rewatch something or if you want to pause something along the way, it's a little bit different from a live stream. So you actually have the ability to do that. So want to make sure that you follow along with us in your Bibles and make sure that you are examining what is being said to make sure that it is so, to make sure that it is properly according to God's will. We desire here to teach only the truth. And to do that, we have to be open and honest and fair about God's word. We have to read it and understand it and teach it in context. In other words, as God intended it to be taught. And that is what we strive to do here. And I'm so very glad you're a part of this. Don't forget if you're on our social media page, either through Facebook or YouTube, please like our Facebook page. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can uh, be a part of future broadcasts as they are up and coming. Well, let's get into tonight's lesson. Uh, let's talk about what we've been talking about. We, several weeks ago, started dealing with the book of Genesis, and we're really specifically looking at the first 11 books of Genesis because the first 11 books of Genesis have often been controversial amongst those who are critics of the Bible. They say that the first 11 books of Genesis are allegorical, metaphorical. They are more poetry than they are history or fact. But as we've already taken a look at the first three chapters of Genesis, we realize that they are historical fact just as God had it written down, just as God intended it. There is no inconsistency. Only in changing that do we find inconsistency. And then we find ourselves at a point where if it's inconsistent with other things in reality, do we choose the word of God or do we choose the other teachings of man? And that, of course, is where the problem lies. And so we want to get into the word. And, and as we have studied Genesis 1, the creation week, the six days of creation, and then as we jump into uh, chapter 2, we talk about the seventh day where God ceased from his creation. He rested. And then we talk about a little bit more of an uh, expounding nature of day six, the day that man was created. We talked about that. And then the last time we talked about Genesis 3, which is where Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. They are tempted by the serpent. 
and ultimately they sin. They go against God's word and they are kicked out of the garden and they also face other consequences such as their sin has now separated them from God and they will ultimately die in this life being prevented access to the tree of life which could have given them immortality in this world. Well, we jump on into our next part of the discussion, and, and our next part of the discussion deals with chapter 4. And I want us to begin in chapter 4 by reading something, being reminded of something from chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 20 reminds us that the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, the man, of course, there is Adam. And Adam, when God took one of his ribs and formed out of that rib the woman, or Eve, we realize that Eve becomes, in essence, the mother of all living. God did not create another man and another woman in the next county. Uh, he did not allow things to evolve from fish to man and some other part of the world, as, as many atheistic evolutionists would argue. No. Uh, Adam and Eve were number one and number two of God's creation of humanity. Adam first, then Eve. Husband first, then wife. And from that relationship, that single marital relationship, that first family, came their offspring. And we're going to talk about that because she was the mother of all living. Everyone who is alive today, if possible, could trace his or her ancestry all the way back to Adam and Eve, and Eve, of course, being declared the mother of all living. So we could trace our ancestry back to them. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a look at Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to talk about the children of Adam and Eve, because thus far we haven't talked about their offspring. That's something that, of course, we get into in tonight's text. So I hope you have your Bibles together. I hope you have them ready. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. You won't have to deviate from that very much at all. Uh, Genesis chapter 4, and we're going to take a look at the children of Adam and Eve, and we're going to begin by breaking down the chapter as we've been doing each of these weeks together, and, and we're going to talk about just exactly what it declares for us, what it reveals for us regarding their children and how many children they had. So let's begin by the first two, meaning the first two children. We take a look at this in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, and we read, Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now, we realize, because later these kinds of things matter, but the firstborn child is Cain and the second born child is Abel. Now, I don't know if you uh, think about this in the way I do. I know ultimately what Cain is going to do to Abel. And so I sometimes think of him as the, uh, the big guy and Abel as the little guy. And, and it's interestingly enough, if I think about a big, strong guy, maybe I think about the hunter. But interestingly enough, it was Abel that was the hunter. It was Abel who was the keeper of flocks. It was he who dealt with animals. Cain, on the other hand, was a farmer. And it doesn't mean that farmers are not big and strong either. No, some of the biggest, strongest people in the world are farmers because that's hard, hard work. But my point to this is it's important to realize what both of them were doing because we're going to get into something in just a minute that's going to be revealing regarding their occupation. So once again, Cain, the firstborn, was a farmer, but Abel was a keeper of the flocks, a shepherd, someone who would tend to the animals. Now, when we jump into the second part of this story, and here's where this is revealed to us, in Genesis 4, verses 3 through 7, we talk about the offerings. Read along with me. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, and its desire is you is for you, but you must master it. 
Now, it's very interesting in this particular situation. We see that Cain and Abel give offerings to the Lord. How do we know how they knew what to do and how to do it? Well, that's not revealed to us. Not every single breath of every single person or every single word that every single individual ever spoke is recorded for us in the Bible. But we do understand that as they were giving offerings to the Lord, they understood that that was something that they were to do. So clearly they had been instructed in it. And they had been instructed on how to do this, even though that's not revealed for us here. But it's interesting. Later on in uh, the book of Hebrews, for instance, Hebrews chapter 11, we would read about Abel and how he offered his offering by faith as opposed to Cain. Now, by faith, what does that mean? So many times we think about faith as just believing, and there's so much more to the word than that. There are times when that's what it means, but there's so much more to the word than that. And I think about Romans 10, 17, by, so that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Put all that together, and it's faith comes by hearing the word of God. So if you think about the fact that Abel did what he did by faith, he was doing things according to the word of God. In other words, according, according to what he had been instructed. Cain, on the other hand, did not seem to work that way. He did not seem to operate by faith. Maybe some of the things he did were according to what he had been instructed to do, but maybe some of the things he didn't, that he did, were not according to what he had been instructed to. Go back to the text for just a moment and look at verse 3. In the course of time... Cain brought an offering of the Lord of the fruit of the ground. That in and of itself should not have been an issue because he was a farmer. So what he would have to give to the Lord would be those things which he farmed and raised or grew in that capacity. And, and we see throughout the Old Testament people giving offerings of grain, offerings of things like, like and maybe very similar to what Cain would have offered here. That may not be the issue. Abel, on his part, brought, brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portion. So Abel gives something uh, of what he worked and did. So he was, a, uh, he was a, a, uh, someone who dealt with the flocks, and so he gave of his flocks. He gave offerings of animals. Now, here's what's interesting. When you look at Abel's offering versus Cain's offering, one little word gets thrown in there that I think is significant. Abel is said to have brought the firstlings of his flock. In other words, the very first that was given to him, that was granted to him by God. Whereas Cain simply gives an offering. Nothing is mentioned that he gives the first or the best of his offering. He simply gives an offering. And I wonder sometimes, is that kind of like us today? On Sunday mornings when the collection plate is being passed, are we giving what we have planned in our hearts to give, what we've prepared to give, and what we're ready to give in that moment? Or do we go, oh, the collection plate's coming uh, and I'll reach in my pocket and hope that I have something that I can give? Is, is that kind of like it is? Maybe that's what it was like with Abel and Cain. Abel gave the first, uh, maybe what we might call the best, but certainly from a prioritative sense, he gave what was given to him first. Cain, on the other hand, we simply read he gave. So he did something, but evidently from what we learn in other passages of Scripture, like in Hebrews 11, perhaps Cain did not give the first or the best. Maybe he had not planned and prepared for this, but very quickly just scrounged up something to put together. We don't know a lot of the details, but we do know this. Abel, the Lord, in verse 4, had regard for Abel and for his offering, verse 5, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. In other words, God was pleased with Abel and his offering. He was not pleased with Cain and his offering. As a result, Cain became very angry in his countenance. His face fell. Uh, so, so you can tell a lot of times when someone is sad or down or depressed because of how their face looks. If somebody's got a big smile on their face or they're laughing or something like that, you wouldn't think anything's wrong. You'd actually think everything's okay. Well, Cain becomes angry. Now, I want you to think about this. God had given instructions. Even though they're not detailed for us, God had given instructions. So Cain's offering is not God's fault. Secondly, 
Abel knew what to do and did it because God had regard for his offering, but once again, not for Cain and his gift. And so Cain's anger is so much like us today. When we get mad at something, we want to blame somebody else when it's really not anybody's fault but ours. We're the ones responsible. And Cain is angry because God has no regard for his offering, but it's all in Cain's hands. Uh, the situation is a result of Cain's choices and decisions. When the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? It's not because God didn't know, but God often asks questions uh, to test people to see whether they are in the faith. Remember uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, he asked them several questions about which he already knew the answer, but he wanted to test them to see how they would respond. Uh, God says, why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desi desire is for you, but you must master it. You know, God says something that's really simple. If you really want to be happy, do what pleases God because knowing God is pleased with us makes it very easy to be pleased in general. But if we do things that we know hurt God, if we do things that we know will ha find no regard in God's eyes regarding us, then that's not going to make us very happy because if truly our goal is to be in heaven one day, we have to do that by pleasing God, not disappointing him. And so basically God is saying, Cain, the choice is yours. The decision has always been yours. And as we talk about often, uh, Cain and Abel, just like Adam and Eve, were, were free moral agents, just like we are. We have the freedom to choose the moral paths that we take in this life. So did Cain. And Cain, for whatever reasons are not clearly described for us, didn't choose the right path. He didn't follow the instructions of the Lord. And as a result, he finds himself in this situation. And, and God warns him, says, if you do these things that are selfish, self-centered, if you do the things that are not pleasing to the Almighty, then there are going to be consequences. He says sin will be crouching at the door. It's, it's waiting to overcome you. And he says to Cain, you must master that. You must learn how to say no to sin. You need to learn how to say yes to righteousness. And you need to make sure that you can distinguish the two so you know which path to take in this life. I think about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. There's two paths you can take in life. There's one that's real easy to follow, and most everybody follows it, but that's going to lead to destruction. There's another path that's kind of small, and it's much more difficult to journey, but that's the one that leads to eternal life. That's the choice that's thrown to Cain. Let's take a look at the third point. Let's talk about verse 8, what we all knew was coming because most of us have heard the story of Cain and Abel from the beginning, let's talk about the murder. And let's talk about how Cain kills his brother Abel. In verse 8, we read that Cain told his brother. I don't know anything more about that. I don't know how Abel responded. Uh, someone could say, well, Abel turned around and made fun of him, and that's what made him. Well, we have no basis to say such a thing. Uh, somebody could say Abel it just gave a really understanding, listening ear, which inflamed Cain all the more. Well, that's nice speculation, but we can't say. All we know is that Cain told Abel about the discussion he had just had. And it came about when they're in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, is that because Cain reacted to something Abel said or did? Well, maybe. We don't know. But at the same time, I want you to think about this in, in, in light of today, for instance. Sometimes things don't go people's way, and they just act out in violence. I think about the riots and the looting and the burnings that sometimes occur in some of our major cities from time to time. They just make no sense. It, it makes no sense. Uh, somebody else does something wrong to somebody else, and this person over here decides to light this business on fire. Uh, that makes no sense whatsoever. And so it could be that Cain's own selfishness, his own self-centeredness, and the fact that he had been found out and exposed by God, and, and because he's told Abel, he's now simply embarrassed because, you know, Abel knows what's going on. Abel knows that uh, uh, Cain has done wrong. Maybe his own sense of pride got to him, and Cain 
took Abel's life simply out of retribution, simply out of his own sense of shame. We don't know, but Cain rose up and killed his brother Abel. Abel was innocent, and from everything that is recorded, Abel did nothing wrong, but Cain killed him anyway. Well, let's take a look at verses 9 through 16. This is a longer passage of Scripture, uh, but this longer passage of Scripture helps us to understand some of the consequences that are leveled on Cain as a result of this first murder. In verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? Once again, God knows where Abel was. God knows that Abel is dead. But he asks, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know Am I my brother's keeper? It's interesting. The very first thing that he says is a flat-out lie. I don't know. It's a lie just as uh, assuredly as the serpent told Adam and Eve in the garden. And then, like his mother and father, he deflects. Uh, then he goes on and says, Am I my brother's keeper? It's kind of like I'm going to ask you a question and put the onus back on you to give the answers because I'm, I'm tired of answering. I don't want to answer anymore. And so Ain, Cain asks that very famous question, am I my brother's keeper? Am I responsible for my brother? Well, from a biblical standpoint, from a godly standpoint, the answer is yes, always has been, always will be. But Cain is deflecting and he says, uh, am I my brother's keeper? God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God knew, and now he's letting Cain know that he knew. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Now remember, Cain was a farmer, and so Whatever ease farming was at this point, even being outside of the Garden of Eden, whatever ease there was in raising crops at that point in time, now it's going to be much harder. It's going to be much more difficult. And then God says, you will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. Now somebody says, well, there was only Cain, Abel, or only Adam, Eve, and Cain at this point in time. So what else we talk? Well, there are going to be more people who are going to pop up into this story. And you're going to also realize that people of this time lived to be a very, very old age. Uh, we'll talk about Adam in just a minute, but we're going to see how Adam lived into his 900s. And so as a result, Cain could have lived for many centuries, and as such, through the people who would grow and multiply in the world at that time, he would become a vagrant and a wanderer. So in a way, he would be an outcast from society because of what he'd done. Well, to this, Cain said to the Lord in verse 13, my punishment is too great to bear. Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground. In other words, you've driven me from what I do in so many ways because it's not going to yield for me like it did before. Uh, and from your face, I will be hidden. Well, that's a good point because... God is not pleased with Cain, and Cain, up to this point, has shown absolutely no remorse for what he's done. He doesn't stop and say, you know something, I was wrong. I have sinned. I am sorry. Please, for nothing like that has happened. Cain is simply saying, from your face I will be hidden, and I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And maybe that was true. Maybe that wasn't true. Needless to say, in the very beginning, there weren't a whole lot of people, so uh, maybe there were people who would look upon him as we do certain criminals today and maybe they would have disdain on him and maybe they would take action on him. If you have enough people who will eventually populate the earth, there, there are enough people to do all kinds of things. So maybe Cain's argument is an excuse. Maybe it's legitimate, but listen to how God answers him. So the Lord said to him in verse 15, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. So in other words, nobody better kill Cain. And let's go back to what would eventually become both an Old Testament and a New Testament commandment. Don't murder. You shall not kill. You shall not murder. Well, the idea is that's against God's law in the first place because God is the only giver of life and God, therefore, by his authority, 
can be the only taker of life. And so in this particular case, God says, if you take, if anybody takes Cain's life, there's going to be consequences seven times what you think will be bad. And then the Lord appointed a sign for Cain so that no one finding him would slay him. Now, we do not know what that sign is. Uh, there have been all kinds of television shows and movies and, and there have been fairy tales and folklore passed down through the ages. Some have, uh, you know, said that it was a mark on his forehead. Uh, some have argued that it was even the color of his skin. And the ones who are arguing this are arguing it from an already pre-existing racial bias, a prejudice, discrimination. And so they're taking their modern day uh, discrimination and th thrusting it on Cain thousands of years before. But we don't know what the mark was. We simply know that God appointed a sign for him so that no one finding him would slay him. Whatever that mark was, it was identifiable. And as people would see it, they would see that that was a mark of Cain. And, and remember, the population wasn't as great as it is today. So word could have spread very easily. If you see this guy with this mark, don't touch him. Don't lay a hand on him. Uh, that's the mark of God, and, and that mark is there so that we will not do anything to him, so that we're reminded we will not do anything to him. And so therein is the consequence. And so in verse 16, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Remember, nobody could go back into Eden, but this was in the land east of Eden, and that's where Cain settled. Now, let's talk about what happens next. Let's talk about another big chunk of scripture uh, in Genesis chapter 4. That's verses 17 through 24, which reveals to us the lineage. Now, not just so much uh, the lineage of one part of the family. I, I want you to read with me what it says. It says, Cain had relations with his wife and she conceived. Now, who was his wife and where did she come from? Well, let me just say by the end of the reading, we'll understand this all together, but it's very simple. His wife was either his sister or one of his nieces. That's just really how it works out uh, because there was no one else on the planet. And somebody goes, oh, that's terrible that he was having relations with his sister or with his niece. Isn't that kind of perverted? Well, not at this time. At this point in time, uh, the bloodline was pure. Uh, it was not something that God opposed. It was certainly how things were begun. And so later on, when uh, the bloodlines get to a point to where this is not healthy for mankind, God says, don't do this anymore. But at this point in time, there are only two choices. As he was not having relations with his mother, the two choices were either a sister who will come along, and we'll read about that in just a little bit, or the child of one of his siblings. And you say, well, there are no more siblings. He killed Abel. Well, there will be by the end of our lesson. So he had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the city, the name of the city, Enoch, after the name of his son. Now to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad became the father of Mehujael. And Mehujael became the father of Methushael. And Methushael became the father of Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. Now, I want to point out something to you. Uh, God never authorizes two wives. He made uh, for Adam, Eve. For Eve, there was Adam. Uh, there was that one man, one woman together for life. That was God's intention from the beginning. But mankind often does what is right in his own eyes rather than what is right in the eyes of God. And so as a result, we see the first polygamist. Certainly the first bigamist, the per first person to have a multiple marriage, and that's Lamech. Lamech took to himself two wives. The name of one was Adah and the name of the other Zillah. Adah gave birth to Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the lyre and harp, uh, lyre and pipe. As for Zillah, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain the forger of all implements of bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. Now, it's interesting. Uh, 
not very many generations after Adam and Eve, you have things like um, tents. Uh, you have things like musical instruments. You have things like the forging of bronze and iron. According to atheists, these kinds of things didn't exist just a few thousand years ago. Um, uh, or they, they say that it happened later in time or something, but they dismiss this. But this is something that is already being revealed. How did these people know about this? Well, the Bible doesn't say. Did God reveal how to do some of these things? Well, possibly. Did people figure it out for themselves? Absolutely. That's an option as well. Think about the pyramids of Egypt. People were able to do engineering feats thousands of years ago that we still can't really figure out uh, because their engineering prowess was so great. But here we have some of that information given to us in these genealogies. In verse 23, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. So we see here that Lamech has, uh, has done a great wrong, and, and he remembers the world understood at that point in time what happened to Cain and his punishment. And so Lamech recognizes that his punishment as well will be great. Now, why is it important for us to take a look at this lineage? Well, the lineage has a lot to do with us being able to tell uh, not only lines of, of genealogy, but also time, because a lot of times there is information that is given with the genealogies of old that help us to understand time frames. They're called chronologies. And we talk about how old someone is when, they're, when they give birth and how old they were when they died, and it uh, allows us to kind of keep a, keep a timeline as to what happens. And this also is revealing to us regarding the age of man and the age of the earth. Well, I want you to continue as we move on. We're going to talk about the third. See, we talked about the first two up here. Now we're going to talk about the third child. Now, it's not the only one, but we're going to talk about the third child right now. Take a look at Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Genesis chapter 4, verses 25 and 26. Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son and named him Seth, for she said, Set God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. Understand something uh, about this particular situation. We don't know that a great deal of time has passed and, and all of this kind of thing uh, where uh, we have multiple generations of, of, of Cain and then all of a sudden uh, Seth is born. No, this would be probably more indicative of Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 where Genesis 1 talks about on day 6, uh, God created animals and man. And then in Genesis 2, it expounds on that a little bit more. So it seems that we've ended our story of Cain, and now we resume the story of Adam and Eve and their line through Seth. So uh, I would suggest that this happened much earlier, much more contemporary to a lot of the occurrences of Cain. But they give birth to Seth, and then in verse 26, to Seth, to him also was a son born, and he called his name Enish. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now it's interesting. Seth. Seth is going to be a great father, and I'll probably explain this a little bit more, but he's going to be a great father of fathers. And it's going to be through his line that righteousness will continue. It will be through his line that we're going to run into a fellow by the name of Noah, who's going to save his family from a flood that God would send all over the earth as a result of uh, the sin of man at that time. But Noah would be righteous. Well, where did he get this righteousness? Where did he know to listen to God and follow his instructions? Well, that would go back up to Seth. And it's it's interesting that, uh, that even though Abel is dead and Cain has been set off in disgrace in essence, the will of God would continue to be adhered to, listened to, obeyed through the line of Seth. And so we don't have a lot to mention here except for this very powerful statement that it is through Seth that men began to call upon the name of the Lord. That means they began not to just cry out God's name, but to obey him, to listen to him, and to follow his instructions 
once again. You see, Adam and Eve, they listened, but they didn't follow the instructions, and they sinned. Uh, Cain listened, but didn't follow instructions because he murdered. And now, through Seth, we're going to see people, once again, who will start listening. Now, not everybody will listen, but through the line of Seth, we will see several people who are righteous individuals indeed, uh, that will be a result of this particular part of the lineage, this third child of Adam and Eve. Let me jump ahead one chapter just so I can throw out this one verse. In Genesis chapter 5 and verse 4, we read, Then the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. First of all, when Adam was 130 years old was when Seth was born. So add 800 to that, we learn that Adam died at the age of 930 years. He was just a few years shy of the oldest recorded man in the Bible, and that was Methuselah, who lived to be 969 years. He was that close. It's a, imagine uh, competing with somebody, and both of you are into your uh, 900s, and the other one pulls ahead just by a tiny little bit. That's kind of how I view things, but needless to say, uh, Adam would live to be a ripe old age, nearly a thousand years old. And then, of course, we see this very important statement. And he, talking about Adam, had other sons and daughters. So what do we say here? Well, in addition to Cain, Abel, and Seth, Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. That means, since they're both plural, he had at least two more sons, and he had at least two more daughters. But if we understand the world back then, how old people lived, how old people lived in childbirth, uh, the idea that Adam's 130 years old when he's given birth to Seth, much less anybody else that comes along after that. And Eve also very old in age. The idea is they could have had countless children that would still qualify as sons and daughters in the plural. So we don't know how many, but needless to say, they had many. Uh, certainly, out of these daughters, Cain could have found a wife. If, if a brother and a sister had relations and had a daughter, then Cain could have married his, his niece. But needless to say, there was certainly the capacity for that at that time. And so we see, and we, are, we have a lot of revelation in Scripture as to the details we need to know to accurately understand just exactly what was going on at that time. And that brings us to a conclusion of Acts chapter 4. I hope you liked that. I hope you enjoyed that study. It's a lot of neat information in there. And I have to say that we get into some of these areas where because of television, because of movies, uh, because of stories that have been passed down through the ages, more like fables and myths and legends, that sometimes there is added to the Word of God things that people just immediately start to assume is fact. It's very important as we go back into some of these scriptures that we make sure we are recognizing what is said and what is not said and then not adding to or taking away from that. That's one of the big no-nos in the Bible. From the beginning of scripture to the end of scripture, God warns us, don't add things to the Bible, don't take away things or ignore things from the Bible, simply recognize what is given, respect that, and then honor me by obeying. And so that's what we want to do. And that's what we try to do in this Bible study each week is to be absolutely fair and accurate with what the Bible reveals to us. Nothing more, nothing less. Well, I want to thank you for joining us and being a part of Bible Study Live this week. Uh, if the good Lord's willing, we're going to be here next week, same time, and hopefully we'll actually be live uh, rather than just a pre-recorded broadcast. But we want to invite you to be there. If the good Lord's willing, we'll be here same time, same channel. So uh, tune into Facebook or to YouTube and make sure you're ready for that broadcast. And I want to encourage you, please uh, work with us in this ministry to get out the word of God as best we can. Uh, if you have social media, uh, if you have an email address, if you have the ability to text, take the link to this broadcast and, and share it with someone. Send them a text and say, hey, uh, watch this series of lessons or send them an email and say, here's a link to a, a video I'd like you to look at. Or maybe you can post it on your own social media. Uh, 
the people who view our videos are often the people who are friends of our pages. But you have different friends. You have different associations. If you'll take this and share it to your social media, then all of those people we don't know and we don't have access to can then have access to this and we can build this audience each week and build this idea of going to the Word of God to study His will for our lives. So I want to encourage you, please join us in this effort to share God's will with the world around us. Now, one thing that I want to say to you is you don't necessarily have to wait until next Wednesday to join us for any type of a study. In fact, if the good Lord is willing, this Sunday morning, you can join us for worship right here uh, at 10 a.m. at 3800 Sebring Parkway in Sebring, Florida. Now, if you're not going to be here in this particular location at that particular time, and we understand most of you won't, then we want to encourage you to do the same thing you've done tonight, and that is to uh, join us online. Join us for this particular uh, time of worship. You can join us by Facebook. You can join us by YouTube. Remember, we are recording both of them, so they're available for you later if you want to go back and look. But this will be an actual time of worship. This is going to be a time where we're going to praise, honor, and glorify God. And we would love to have you, even if it's online, join us to sing with us, to pray with us, to partake of the Lord's Supper with us, to give as you are able, and then to participate in the proclamation or the preaching of God's Word. We would love to have you. This Sunday morning, there's going to be a real important lesson that I'm going to be addressing. And it's something that in this day and age, everybody needs to hear because it's a part of the will of God that so many people are neglecting or outright ignoring. And so we're going to take a look at that Sunday morning and I hope that you'll be with us at that time so that you can give praise to God right along with us. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate this opportunity to be with you and even though we had a couple of hiccups the last two Wednesday nights, we appreciate you joining us once again and being a part of this ministry. Uh, we love you and we hope to see you again soon. Until we meet again, as we say, each and every week. May God bless you and keep you always in his care.